Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today is our gospel lesson from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 16. And please rise as we hear these words again in Jesus' name. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. This coming Tuesday will be six years since Osama bin Laden was killed by SEAL Team 6. I remember where I was when I first heard that bin Laden was killed. I was in my car, driving home to Mankato, Minnesota. I had just played golf, of all things, with one of my college teammates at a course where I played for free because it was my birthday month. I remember thinking it was a good thing that bin Laden had been killed. His death was obviously deserved, and in a way, it brought an end to a very painful chapter in our nation's history. But really, even though bin Laden's death was certainly deserved, it didn't actually help anyone. It didn't undo any of his evil acts. When he was killed, the Twin Towers in New York were not miraculously rebuilt nor were any of the thousands of people whose deaths he orchestrated on 9-11 brought back to life. So, even though we may think it's a good thing when evil people like Osama bin Laden get what they deserve, we have to admit that this justice doesn't fix anything. It doesn't replace their evil with good. In fact, not even the death of a good person does any good. It is true that the example of a good life can also inspire others to live well. For example, those in our nation's history who promoted equal rights for all races in the face of hatred and violence is a good model for us. It is a way of living that we should see and be inspired by and follow. But not even the deaths of people like that can help anyone. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 49, Truly no man can ransom another, or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly, and can never suffice. This is what sets Jesus apart from everyone else. Not only did Jesus die as the best man, but he died, he gave his life for his sheep. Jesus' life was not taken away from him. He wasn't assassinated, as has happened to so many of the great figures of history. Jesus said, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Unlike is natural for every mortal human being, Jesus did not see death facing him and run away from him. Nor, when he was being killed, did Jesus curse his enemies or try to hurt them. Jesus embraced death. He gave his life willingly as the substitute for every single condemned citizen. As the good shepherd, Jesus gave his life for the sheep. That is how Jesus has helped us. He died for us. He purchased us with his own blood and blood and redeemed us from death. Jesus made our suffering to be his suffering. He took our sins onto himself and made them his sins. Of course, Jesus did not do this for himself. Jesus fought and conquered by suffering and dying for the sins of the whole world. 
He gave himself to buy us, to make us his sheep through the forgiveness of sins. That is what makes Jesus the good shepherd. Not only do his sheep belong to him, but as St. Peter tells us in his first epistle, Jesus did not buy us with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. But, as Jesus tells us, a shepherd who is hired hasn't done any of that. The hired hand watches over the sheep because he is being paid to. They aren't his sheep. He hasn't shed his blood for them. He hasn't died for them. The sheep he is watching over haven't cost him anything. In fact, the opposite is true. These sheep are his source of income. So compared to Jesus, a shepherd who considers himself to be hired doesn't really care about the sheep. He doesn't care if they are forgiven of their sins or not. The thing that sets us free is this forgiveness. The divine message of the good shepherd who laid his life down for his sheep is the gospel by which sinners like us are forgiven of our sins and saved from death. The voice of our shepherd is the one that calls us to say it. When we hear his voice and follow it, then we are saved. When we have been brought by Jesus to his gospel, then the devil can't touch us. But when we can't hear Jesus' voice, when we put ourselves or allow ourselves to be put into situations where we cannot hear his gospel, then we're in trouble. The devil is a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. He will crack us down and do everything he can to kill us. This is why we need to stay with Jesus. It is only with Jesus that we are saved. We know him because he knows us. Jesus hasn't known us only for as long as we've known him. Jesus has known us since before we were born. He chose us to be his sheep. He brought himself down to our level for the very purpose of bringing us into his flock. So he knows what it's like to walk in our shoes. He knows what it feels like to be tempted in all the ways that we're tempted. He knows what it's like to hear the devil calling us away from the safe pastures of the Christian church into the seeming exciting danger of this world. But at all those times, and in all those ways, in which we have followed the devil's voice and given into his temptations, Jesus resisted. He kept himself as the one truly blemish-free Lamb of God, so that as one of us in our place, he could suffer and die as we deserve to, to take away the world's sins. So don't ever think that Jesus doesn't know his sheep. And he will. Don't ever think that we could know Jesus apart from this. It's not a matter of intelligence that a sheep knows its shepherd. To get out of this illustration for a moment into reality, sheep are not very smart animals. If Jesus had wanted to choose a smart animal for this illustration, he would have picked a cat or a dog or some other animal that can take care of itself. But a sheep can't take care of itself. A sheep can't bring itself to safety. The only thing a sheep can do is to hear and follow the voice of someone who can keep it safe. As sheep, all that we can do is hear and follow Jesus' voice in the gospel. And that's all we have to do. To be with Jesus, safe from harm and danger, hearing and believing his gospel is enough. We see in the gospel, that Jesus does not want to bring us into his flock so that he can benefit from us personally. The figureheads of the false religions of the world, the higher shepherds, they're not like this. While they were alive, they did want to benefit from their followers, for power, for money, and even for sex. But of course, the inventors of the false religions of the world did not want their people to see this about them. So they distracted them. They distract their people with the one thing that we naturally want to see more than anything else. They distracted them with the ridiculous notion 
that through pious intentions and hard work, we can reconcile ourselves to God. Now, the reason why this is such an appealing idea is that if we believe it, we don't have to think about ourselves as being stupid, helpless sheep. We are worth something. We're powerful. Even if we admit that we're sinners, we don't have to think this means we're all bad. We still have inside of us the potential to be basically good people who live good lives. And of course, this is halfway true. If you do try your hardest to follow the Ten Commandments, you will live a happier, more fruitful life than if you did it. But what protection is there in this message? What comfort is there when you don't live like you're supposed to live? There isn't any comfort in that kind of moral guidance, nor is there any protection. This is because the devil will come for you. He will attack you in your life. He will tear it apart and show you how helpless and immoral you really are. And the devil will attack you in your faith. He won't do this obviously so that you know it's him. Instead, the devil will attack your faith subtly in ways that actually seem good and smart to you. Instead of directing you to God's word for all truth, the devil will direct you to yourself to your own logic and reason, and to your own sense of right and wrong, instead of that which God has given in his word. The devil won't just tell you outright, don't believe anything God tells you. Instead, he will try to poke little holes in your faith. Maybe picking out the creation account in Genesis, or the question of whether or not the Lord's supper and baptism are really God blessing us and giving himself to us, or if the real meaning of the sacraments is our unified love and devotion to each other and to God. The devil will try to chip away like this, here and there, wherever you're most vulnerable, tearing your faith down and making it weaker and weaker and gradually pulling you further and further away from Jesus' voice in the gospel. After all, that is the devil's goal for you and for all of Jesus' sheep. He wants you to take you away from Jesus by taking you away from the gospel. He wants to deprive you of the healing forgiveness you can only receive from the blood of Christ. The devil attacks you in your faith because that is how you are connected to Christ. Without your faith and without the Savior to whom your faith is directed, and to whom your faith connects you, you are no longer in Jesus' flock. But that doesn't mean you're a sheep without a shepherd. Without Jesus as your good shepherd, no matter who it may be that you're letting lead you at a given moment, the devil is your shepherd, which is every bit as bad as that sounds. Without Jesus and his gospel, you are cut off from life itself. Spiritually speaking, without the gospel, you might as well not have any food or water to even drink or even air to breathe. Now, contrary to how it might appear, and unfortunately contrary to how some of its outward manifestations have acted in history, the Christian church is not a business or a government with a great big power structure. The Christian church is, quite simply, the flock of those who hear the voice of Jesus, their shepherd. Right now, the Christian church is full of people who still sin, which means that the glory of the Christian church is obscured underneath the sin and weakness of its members. But even though the church is humble and thought of poorly by the world, it is the greatest organization you could ever hope to be part of. The Christian church is the sum total of those whom Jesus has made to hear his voice as their shepherd. Even though the Christian church and those who are part of it may seem to be poor and weak and culturally on the downswing, the church and all its members are rich beyond compare, and they have in their midst the greatest, most powerful divine and human shepherd. Right now, the world is full of many different churches, 
many of which claim to be Christian. And unfortunately, the world is just as full of many different confessions of faith, some closer to God's word and some much further away. But even in the midst of this seemingly confusing diversity, there is still only one shepherd. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ and trusts him as his or her savior from sin and death, that person is a member of the one flock of Christ's church. In the Christian church, there are no divisions between ethnic groups or ages or anything. The church is one, just as Jesus says it is. We all have the same relationship with Jesus, where we are his sheep and he, are his, and he is our shepherd. Through the means of grace, we all receive the same forgiveness of sins and are filled with the same Holy Spirit. This is the blessed reality that Jesus has established. The true and perfect unity of the Christian church is not something that we, its members, have created through clever negotiation and compromise. The only thing that we can create in the church is division and other. No, this true and perfect unity that we have with each other and with God is Jesus' gift to us, bought with his own precious blood and death on the cross, and then declared in the resurrection. The good shepherd who once laid down his life for his sheep will continue to guard and keep his flock on earth until he comes back comes back visibly to take us all home. In the meantime, we will continue to trust in his salvation and hear his voice and follow him in our lives to faith. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.